Hi, I'm Wendy Yi. Welcome to the Dice Tower. We're continuing on with our top 100 list for the week. And for me, this is number 70 through 61. This is an interesting mix here of new games as well as old games for me. So let's go ahead and get started and I'll talk about and share them with you. Let's go ahead and start off the list with number 70. This game is Sabika. Now, Sabika is a fun little gem that I found this year. So it is a mid-weight to heavy Euro game. And what's really interesting and unique about it is a couple different things. So for one, it has three different rondelles that you're moving your workers around. And each one of those rondelles has basically a different category of action. So they each have a couple different actions that you can take um, on them, but they're all different. And so you can't keep spamming the same thing. You have to diversify but you don't have to diversify too much because there's obviously tons of exploration that I enjoy doing in games. And so if it, if it sent me down a very specific track every time, um, it wouldn't be this high on my list. So you definitely have choices within those rondelles and you can choose to spend extra to move forward farther. Um, but obviously like resources are a little bit tight, so you can't just waste them all by running around that track to whatever actions you want all the time. Um, so it is an interesting, interesting little game there. But then what else really fascinated me with it is that the things that you are doing in this game, the things that you are building up, um, they have a basic cost. And that basic cost is not that expensive. So every round you can be building stuff as long as you take those actions and you can get a building action on that rondelle. Um, but you can build and they give you benefits. And a lot of times it's some sort of engine building benefit um, or an end game scoring benefit. So it kind of helps you the now and through the rest of the game. But you can also choose to overspend. So if you get a diversity of resources, you can spend more different resources and you're still getting those basic benefits of building, but then you can also get a lot of points. And so it is a fun balance of, do I want to save those resources so that I can build this round and next round so I can get more engine building? Or do I think I'm gonna get more resources by next round so I can spend what I have now get more points and then next round build again and still get that engine building going on. So it's just really, really good decisions. This is one that I wish that more people were talking about because I very much enjoyed it. So Sabika is my number 70. Next up is 69 and this is San Juan. Now San Juan has a turn structure that I've seen in a few different games, especially more recently like Ares Expedition and Earth. Um, but this is one of those games where whoever is the lead player, you get to choose the action for the table, then everybody else takes that same action. But if you were the chooser, you get to do an extra benefit for it. So you're like, oh, I'll take the governor action. I get to do what everybody else does plus something. Um, and I just really enjoy that particular mechanism because you're not waiting a ton between people's turns, but instead you get to go right away, right away, right away. And this is one that has stayed on my top 100 list, even though I haven't played it in a few years because I just have such good memories of it. And because it is just one of those games where you are always engaged or always involved. Um, and so you're, you're building up resources and you're trying to build buildings in front of you. Um, and to score the most points at the end of the game. And I do think that all of that is just really interesting, the way that those cards work and the way that the, the actions go. And then when it's your turn to pick, you're always like, oh, I want it all. What do I get to pick? So definitely a great game. San Juan is my number 69. My number 68 is Istanbul. And this is an old, old friend. Um, this is one of the games that I played really early on in my board gaming experience. I remember going to Meepleville in Las Vegas as a board game cafe, and it was one of the very first games that Tim, the owner, taught us. And so it has been around on my list for a while. It is such an interesting worker movement game where you have this grid in front of you and you're trying to move workers. You place them based on where your previous stuff, your discs were but eventually you run out of discs. So if you go back to a spot where you already had a disc, you get to pick that disc up. And so you're just moving this like stack of discs around, dropping them little by little. It kind of feels like breadcrumbs. Like I'm leaving a trail of breadcrumbs and then I'm coming back and I'm I'm picking them up so that I can leave them some, you know, on a different trail. Um, but it is just, it's just such a really cool game. This actually used to be 10 on my list and then it tragically moved down to 15. And then now it like super dropped to 68 but it's one I still love. There's just so many good new games that come out. Um, and 
I don't want to always be cold to the new because there's so much there's so much good that comes from games that have been around for a while. Um, this is one I've loved, but I just haven't gotten it to the table. And so sadly it is 68 instead of 15 or 10, but it is one that I would still definitely play and I definitely love. So Istanbul 68. My number 67 is new to me, even though it is not really a new game anymore. Um, and that is Stay Cool. This is a game where you're, it's a party game where someone on your right side is trying to ask you questions and someone on your left side is asking you completely different questions. One you answer verbally, the other one you answer by moving over these little letter dice since you have to like spell a three to five letter word. Um, it's just, it is utter chaos. It is tons of fun. This is a good convention game if you want to just get a bunch of people to play and be like, hey, let's do absolute chaoticness. Let's just make fun of each other for being like, ah, 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 answer, 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 answer. I love it. I absolutely love it. So keep your cool, stay cool, and play stay cool. So that's my number 67. My number 66 is To Let Em. Now this game is new to me as well as actually being new. Um, it is the newest of the tea games in the Board and Dice tea game series. And in this game, you're moving around on a map, you're trying to build up pillars as well as houses, you're, you know, building fancy cathedrals and stuff or investing in them. And you're trying to meet goals so that you can fulfill each one of these end of round uh, scoring requirements. And so you need to go to a city where that festival is taking place. You need to complete whatever those scoring things are. Um, and then at the end of the game, there's a little bit of scoring as well. Uh, but mostly you're trying to meet those objectives at the end of each round. What's really interesting to me is the way that you select your actions, you decide what you're doing. So you have these dice um, that everyone, or you roll a big chunk of dice, and then they go around based on number, they're assigned to an action. But that action is inversely related to the number of what the die is. So if the die is five, you put it on the five action, you take whatever that action is at a five strength, but then inversely you get resources based on the opposite of that, what it would be. So it would be a two, right? This is the opposite of a five on a die. Um, so you would get two resources of whatever that die color is and five of that action. Whereas if you went to the one spot, you would get one action point, but you would get six resources for that particular spot. So it's just, it's really interesting the way that that inverse relationship works with the dice. So you want the right color, you want the right action, and you want the right quantity number um, of that die. So it's, it's really interesting, fascinating. I really enjoyed to let them. What a good, great game. And uh, the T-Series just keeps on kicking them out and I keep enjoying them for the most part. Next up is 65 and this game is Resurgence. Now Resurgence is by Stan Kordonsky, which is a designer that I definitely am feeling like I want to follow more. Um, he did Endless Winter last year, which was my favorite game of the year. And now Resurgence I've played and I've really loved um, I've played it a few times now, and so I, I'm amazed it made it on this list, um, just kind of in the nick of time. But I, I really enjoy it. So it's this idea of you're building your bag of these workers, and you're pulling them out every round, um, and you're assigning them to three different colored locations. So you've got red locations, blue locations, and then you kind of have your home board of actions that you can do. And you're secretly putting them out and then you're revealing, everyone's revealing at the same time, and then whoever has the majority of like strength points or whatever in each one of those regions gets to move up on a cool scoring track and you get little bonuses. Then you place your workers out and it's one of those, I, I know where other people are generally going and I can kind of read a little bit of what they might do, um, but I can put workers out in any of those locations based on where I signed them. So I think like, ooh, okay, someone else has assigned a lot to red so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put out my, my red location first, even though I would prefer to do blue first and then go to red, but I don't want them to take my spot and make it more expensive for me to go there. So there's just some really interesting decisions there. Um, there's a lot of engine building. You're building your bag, you're building your player board, um, you're getting new special abilities that you can tap each round and use. So there are just, there's a lot of engine building going on in this game. It's a fun uh, post-apocalyptic theme too, where there's like, um, mutant guys that get in your way um, and you're trying to go on these little like quest-like things to, I don't know, save the day or something or build up society. I don't know. Pace it on theme a little bit, but a cool theme nonetheless. And 
For me, I mostly care about the mechanics. I think the mechanics are great. Um, and aesthetically, it is pleasing as well. So Resurgence, Stan Kardonsky, um, keeping an eye on you, sir. Keeping an eye on you. Next up is 64. This game is Lisboa. So this is a heavy game, and the theme behind it is that um, Lisboa was destroyed by what, like earthquake and fire and something else, maybe an army, I don't know, stuff. Three bad things happened to it, and so you're rebuilding it, and you have to, you know, balance the the, the finances of the city as while well, you're rebuilding the rubble and stuff. Um, there's some really cool things going on. I really enjoy the mechanisms of it. Um, it's one of those heavy, crunchy Lacerda games. And in fact, um, it's one that Chris doesn't love playing, which is sad because I very much enjoyed it. Um, and so it's one that I think I need to find some people at conventions that, that want to play something thinky, crunchy, and heavy and hard to uh, remind me of how the rules go. But I really, really enjoyed Lisboa. It's tons of fun. Um, it was 57 on my list, now it's 64. So it's kind of in the same general cat like range of my top 100. And um, yeah, it's just really good. Really, really want to play it again. Really cool uh, ways that the actions are driven and stuff. And you're building up your board in front of you. Lots of good things. Lots and lots of good things. So that is my number 64, Lisboa. Number 63 on my list is Majesty for the Realm. This is another one that's moved up for some reason. Um, it was at 80, now it's at 63. Um, it is a game that I did get to play relatively recently, like within the last year or so. Um, and what you're doing is you are you are getting cards from a market and you are putting them in these like seven different areas. So based on what card character you get, you put it in front of you, in front of your little tableau. and. If you get a lot of the same, they're worth a ton of points. If you get diversity, they can be worth a ton of points. Um, but they level up their actions. So the more you have in a column, the stronger that action gets. The more you have wide, the more points you get. Um, it's just a really interesting um, game where you're trying to build up in all those different directions, but also you are affecting each other. Some actions give benefits for you and everybody else. Some benefits attack everybody else. And so you're actually like sending their cards to the dungeon so that they um, get removed so that they're not as strong of actions and maybe they're not worth as many points. Um, so it's just really interesting that balance of, hey, do I want to get the really expensive cards that are hard to get that everyone's fighting for? Or do I want to build up kind of a midweight engine and, you know, fight and punch each other or protect myself? Just really interesting stuff going on. I do wish this one had a little bit um, more buzz behind it when it came out because I definitely think that it was very good. So number 63 was Majesty for the Realm. Next up is 62. This is Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig. Now this is a mouthful of a game name, right? Um, but what I really enjoy about this game is this is a, this is like a, this is what I wish semi-cooperatives were. I guess it almost feels like a semi-cooperative because you're working with the people next to you to build up two castles um, with all the cool Mad King Ludwig um, like connection bonuses. Like, hey, we don't want a bedroom next to a loot room because people don't want to be listening to music all night long while everyone's partying. Uh, but we do want to be next to a garden because gardens are pretty and fancy and we want to look out our window at the garden. Uh, so there's like all these connection bonus rules, but you're building up these two castles and then you score the lowest of the two. So you can't just fully invest in, you know, the castle to your right and be like, ha ha ha, forget that one. But instead you're trying to keep them as balanced as possible. And so the person with the most points or the most balanced um, castle is the one who wins basically. So I, I really enjoy it. This is one that I wish that more people loved because I thought it was just absolutely amazing. Um, I had played Castles of Mad King Ludwig and I loved it because of the interesting connection bonuses of the rooms and everything. And then I played Between Two Cities and I loved it because it's just really interesting the way that the grid is less complicated than Castles of Mad King Ludwig. There isn't the little like auction-y phase and all that kind of stuff of trying to sell pieces on your turn to get money. There's none of that. Um, it just kind of combined the two and I loved it. Absolutely loved it. So that was my number 62, Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig. <laughs> Last up on my list is Beyond Balderdash. Now, I grew up playing regular plain Jane Balderdash, which was just fine. Um, and the way that worked is that um, everyone at the table makes up a fake definition for a word that the person who's it um, has in front of them. And it's usually some ridiculously large word that most 
normal people don't know. Um, and so you make up some fake definition and then all the definitions are read and people vote on what they think is the real definition. So if you made up a fake one and you got votes, cool, you got points. If you uh, made the real one and someone else voted for it, then they get points because they picked the correct one. So it's just a, it's just one of those like super fun, easy party games. This was 74 on my list. Now it's 61. Um, it's just been really, really good to play with people. So the Beyond Balderdash was something I was interested I was introduced to just a few years ago. Instead of just definitions, it adds in like story plot lines and movies and just like other interesting things or weird laws. Like that one was really fascinating. You're like, this is a weird law about like not putting chewing gum under tables or something like that. Like there are just weird stuff out there. And so, so often the actual real answers sound stranger than the stuff people come up with. And I love it. I love that it's so weird. So Beyond Balderdash, tons of fun, my number 61. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. That was my top 100, number 70 through 61. We are almost halfway there, my friends. Woo, working through these top 100. I hope you're enjoying them. I hope that you are checking out everyone else's as well and you're just having an absolute blast. Um, we are, of course. So this is our top 100. Thanks for joining me. I'm Wendy Yee. Have an absolutely fabulous day. Mm -hmm.